because you are going like this, you are just saying hello. How many people do you think have cell phones today? Of where? No, but you are not too far. Yeah, but that's that's something to specify. And why is it interesting to find out how many people have cell phones? Okay, then we go to another question. What percentage of people have laptops or PC access? More or less than cell phones? More? Less, quite right? less. Who uh, yeah. uh, One of the best questions is on how You can do both the phone and you can do it a lot more. For most people, like, they don't really need as much as you can. Uh, well, I used to be able to cheat on the smartphones. So you can leave it. That's part of the market. Then the smartphones, the smartphones are even more affordable than the laptops. And so that's what I'm doing. Okay, okay. So we're pulling these ideas together. Come on. It's also necessary for the everyday life of the cell phone and the laptop. I don't know if it's a phone phone, it's a phone call, communicate. You know, I find it amazing how you guys get into technology and that's your, uh, uh, where it is today is where always it was. Where did it start this thing? You had, first you didn't have computers at all. Then you kind of build this sort. I installed a computer in Brazil in uh, my, when I was at a sophomore in college, it was the first computer in the uh, Latin America. And it was something about the size of this room, maybe a little bigger. Okay, and the reason I got involved in this is because they came to my engineer, uh, electrical engineer, said, does anyone here speak English? And I went like this, because you know, it's always bad news to volunteer for anything. But, and I was born in girls at beach, so, um, so uh, I went there and saw four of us were picked, and they had this new machine from Burroughs Corporation, uh, and they didn't know how to put it together, and Burroughs didn't know how to put it together, okay, and they had the guys there, and they, well, it wasn't together, I just thought, so we had an idea, and we put the thing together, and the thing had 8K of memory. 8K, you know what that is? About one million of what you have in your cell phone. Okay, depending how you call computer. Yes? Okay, and the way you program this thing was with machine code. Machine codes are zeros and ones. And it had a word size of 16, and you would have one address, two address, and operation. <coughs> And that's what we did. And uh, it had also a board, and the board had the keys on it. And you would program it with the keys, or you have paper pen. And you would read the paper in, in machine code. And when you made a mistake, you would put the paper thing there, the scotch tape on it, and there was a little block with holes, and you would make holes for the right thing. Fun, huh? And anyway, that in a few years changed, not too many years, and we got this thing uh, called, uh, called uh, Fortran. And so it was a code that you actually had words in it and it was much easier to use. And the people don't even remember Fortran, but Fortran, COBOL, the big languages mm -hmm. that basically created computer. But it was a real mainframe. And you have to have a punch card or punch paper to go to. And uh, this is a long story, but it's kind of full of fire. Sometimes I show slides on this. And after uh, you enter the data that way, uh, you would have to actually enter the data, you enter your program, and then you have to get some data in for the program to act on. And if the program was too big, you have to segment it in pieces and do a little bit, do a little bit, do a little bit. Um, 
And with passing of time, you know, this became more complex, better, and started having uh, this idea of connecting to a computer. And uh, the main motivator to remote connection to a computer, it wasn't very remote, it was by wire, uh, was the idea of, uh, of airline reservations, ideas of many people <coughs> using the computer and take advantage that inside computer move very fast. And so they started doing this thing that they started at that time they called time sharing, and it was really a computer with wires into it, and several people using it, getting the impression that they were the only user of this big computer. And at that time, the memories had gone from 8K to 8,000K uh, or, or something like that. And so these things were kind of going that way. They had these terminals. And think about this, computer security of today, cyber security is the big issue today, correct? Now, what was the cyber security issue in a computer in a room with no wires? What's the guard in the door with a machine gun and good walls around it? That was how you kept security. And then you identified who went in there. If you had any problems, you know who caused it. The moment you added the wires into it, you actually immediately created a security problem. Why? Because you didn't know who was accessing the computer, you gave them a password. And the password created its own security problems. Do you give the password to your girlfriend? To your password? Don't, don't say yes. You shouldn't do it. Or maybe it doesn't have a girlfriend. So. You would? Bad idea. <laughs> Don't give your password to anyone. Ever. Not give it to your uh, uh, And so there was this kind of remote connection. And progressively they developed a multi block technology, which instead of putting a fixed wire to somewhere, you could go over telephone wires and someone in the remote area connected. And at the same time, they could put two or three terminals connected to this wire. And why did they do that? Basically to make telecommunication costs less. But think about this, how clumsy this whole thing was. And the first, the box that you had to go to there. And you had to read the paper there. And that you had to read cards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you put the wires around, and you have to be physically around there and connect. And then it kind of goes a little bit remotely, still these big, big clunk, clunky machines. And that was kind of the paradigm of computing for a while. Things developed. But after, after that happened, um, progressively, they had this idea of creating smaller computers for hobbies. And the hobbyist things like Commodores were developed, and they were not too big. And a lot of the large manufacturers said, uh, who wants a little computer with absolutely no power? That little computer with absolutely no power had already 100 times more power than the original computer that I was describing. Okay? And some of the companies totally missed the boat. They had no idea that these smaller computers were going to be important. Actually, the head of IBM Mr. Thomas Watson Jr. said, there is a market for five computers in the world. And then the guy who, who, who led Digital Equipment Corporation, a mid-sized computer manufacturer, said, who needs a computer in their home? So they had no idea, really, of, of, the, of what happened. And then, it's still, and, oh, and then this company called Apple, came out with this Apple II, okay? And uh, it was kind of a neat, nifty thing, and a lot of people were buying it, and they offered themselves for IBM. And IBM said, no, we're not interested in buying it. And you know the history from that. And after that, uh, basically came this whole idea of better personal computers. First, the personal computer had a kind of uh, let the interface with, uh, 
uh, whereby you type in and you would get a command line, you've seen command lines before. And then they had Apple came out with a Mac, and before the Mac, the Lisa, that was kind of a graphic user interface, whereby you could use a mouse and you could point to things, and et cetera, et cetera. Making life much easier to the users of those things. And then people came up with this idea of a laptop, uh, and the laptop was basically a Apple II or whatever, kind of compressed. And while we were coming with that, the computers were becoming more and more, and these laptops were becoming more and more powerful, very interesting kind of devices. Okay, and then they created these uh, many different types of these laptops. And progressively, what came after that? same time tablets were emerging, cell phones were emerging, correct? And the cell phones were like what? Like dumb terminals, correct? Just made phone calls. And then progressively what happened? They put an operating system on a cell phone and they got what? Huh? They powered the computer in what we call smartphone today. Okay, and that's progressive evolving. And at the same time, at the same time, what, what was happening? What did you say? What happened besides this? Well, besides the cell phone development, what else was developed? Tablets, yes. And tablets came in very in many families of being. And what we have now. We have this whole domain of smartphones, tablets, laptops, nice computers. And what is it? Why did some of you say, mumbled here, that smartphones replace computers? And why is that? They didn't do a lot of basic functions. Actually, some of you, as someone was saying here, oh, well, a smartphone has more powerful, has more applications than a computer, than a laptop. Didn't I hear say someone say that? Isn't that true? Does a, does a cell phone, a smartphone, have more applications? It's a trick. I'm asking a trick question. Yeah, they are applicable to both, but, but do they have more, can they, can they do more things? Yeah. It's a trick question. And is there more applications? Yes, because there are different brands of, of cell phones, and they have a huge, there are millions of applications being sold or distributed in the markets. And typically, laptops were not originally developed for apps, okay? What they were developed is for big programs installed around the operating system. And so the variety is a little small, uh, or smaller. And however, it goes all over the map uh, in both sides. But the reason why smartphones are more popular and there are more of them is a very simple, simple one. They're cheaper. Okay? And so they're more ubiquitous, more common. Okay. So that was it necessary background once I realized. So this is the number here for you. 3.4 billion internet users. So 46% of the people have internet. Can you believe someone without internet? Like who? Uh, well, your grandmother, your grandfather? No, I have a professor. He, uh, after every final exam, he would go back to Greece and he would send us a deal because he said, my parents' house does not have internet. Oh, okay. Greece. Yeah. yeah. My mom's house in Rio de Janeiro, she passed away. There's a lot of internet. And many networks 
feeling, but yes, that's, uh, that, that's like places that people often not have That's very little. What is the other reason why you don't have it? The huh? the there is no infrastructure, like you're in Africa in some place. Okay, maybe less in South America and Africa in some places. In some places, the motivation. Uh, what is the other reason? If your income per day is one dollar a day, can you really afford it? Only one service. What is it? Government gives it. Many governments are doing that for that purpose. Still need the device that costs money. And there are these devices, the smartphones are more expensive than the dumb phones. But the, the, the business. So the overall view is that there are much more smartphones, devices, and there'll be much more than anything else. Now, the internet access became a smartphone game. Yes? What's the penetration of in America? Uh, I think he was kind of right in the 80s, depending how you count it. Very high. Very high. Who doesn't have telephone, cell phone? My granddaughter is three and a half, and she begs me to watch the TV. And do you know what it means, watch TV? Just pick up this mind, and she knows how to get into it. And I developed this very interest on, on this day, Junior, and I'm counting one to three and identifying letters. So she finds the app there, and she goes, the one and a half year old still doesn't do telephone. Although he tries to throw my telephone across it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, children, very young children. Who else? People in very areas. Rural areas, illiterate people, and very old people that can have difficulty, physical difficulty to read them. And that's really, uh, and everyone else wants it. Now the question is, can they get But uh, this is a, look at how many smartphones exist, okay? And this is the next type of thing. You know, to this uh, month we are together, I'm going to be yelling at you every time you look at your cell phone. Why? Because I want you to learn to spend an hour, two hours, or three hours without looking at your cell phone will give you a competitive advantage. And you go in an engagement in audit, you're playing yourself on all the time, it's not going to be a good idea. Okay, and this is a very serious problem of attention span that we have developed in the latest 10 years or so. And we are going to talk about, uh, about how, is, how our cell phone computers are affecting your brain, and you're going to see that the multitasking that we do today is a terrible, enemy of your ability of logically thinking and bringing facts together. Your, this course is going to be very different from your other courses. I don't ask you to memorize anything. I, my exam, end of the semester, is open book, open internet, close friends. Okay? Um, and so you see a lot of different things in my method of education. I always ask, uh, what do you need to remember in the age of Google? And uh, I have visited the CPA folks, the people that give the CPA exam. We had that conversation. And uh, what did the conversation have? I said, why are you uh, requiring people to memorize all these facts? And the half-life of the knowledge is about two and a half years. So in five years, they're going to do all these complicated facts that Professor Samara will teach you in accounting, but you'll forget most of them because you'll never use them. Until you're a manager. She was a manager, isn't that true? I was a senior associate. So, did you need them? <laughs> okay, she was a PwC, and this is the fact. So I asked them this question. And they said, oh, it's very difficult to change things. And no one kind of said, no, you're saying stupid things. Okay, it's very difficult to change things. They had this thing called NASMA, 
and NASDAQ is an association of state boards of accountants and a couple of others. That's 54 entities, so there must be a couple of others. And they determine what goes in the CPA exam. Tomorrow I'm going to, I don't need to speak to NASDAQ in one of the conferences in the hope that I can convince them eventually to make it a more rational form of exam that would be very beneficial. But the, the generic idea here, and they are changing the exam. The exam became a little bit more interpretative, a little bit less memorization. Uh, actually, the exam just started now in 17. It's a changed exam. Uh, but it's changing very slowly for this kind of modern age here. OK, now look at the other things that she talks about here. This number three that I started talking about. Americans spend 5.6 hours a day engaged in digital media, three and a half, 3.1 hours on mobile, 2.2 hours on laptop and desktops. Now, that's a lot of time spent. How much time do you guys spend on your cell phone or your cell phone? Just give me all together. How many hours do you think? You have no idea, correct? How many do you think you spend on there? <laughs> you spend much more than that. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> so, have you talked about multiplied by 85 years that you expect to live, or 89 years that you expect to live? Um, uh, how many hours you're going to spend fiddling with the device? Is that good or that bad? I got a smile here, but she didn't say good or bad. Uh, what do you think? It's bad for, well, it's bad for your health. Bad for your health? But, but you can't help it. Uh, okay, Sorry. let's not do good or bad because that becomes very complicated. Uh, but I, I, gave, I kind of left something hanging here that I wanted to talk to you about for a second. Is remember I was talking about this big computer connected and the cyber security danger. And what I basically was trying to tell you is something I always say technology given, technology taken. Every time you get a new technology into something, you are getting some facilitation of doing something. It's good. But the moment that you put new technology in place, you are creating some hazards. You're creating some risks. And the two major risks are, can you tell me? Maybe three. Now that uh, she brought your health into this, I forgot about that one. Uh, it caused a loss of jobs. Okay, that's number four. That's <laughs> <coughs> not uh, bad. Enough. Oh, I think the two biggest risks. Privacy, correct, and security. Okay, those are the things that, add, you know, any additional set of information you get is a risk to privacy. Have you ever thought of the following? I actually, that's good. I want to put a new article into, into, your, into your folders. Uh, have you ever thought what information about you is spread all over? or someone has access to it. First question is, what does Google know about you? No, no, let's be specific. What do you think Google knows about you as primary source of information? Uh, Google. Am I supposed to hang out or yeah. say Kai? Yeah. Hang out, I'm not going to remember that. So, so Google, uh, mm -hmm. I used to look everything. They, you know, where I've been to, in a phone I call those Good, that's a very elaborate response. Good. Now, why does Google allow you to search for free? They want the data. They need the data. Uh, so that's Google. 
Uh, the easiest one to think about is, you know, not everyone does what a Hangout does, which is put everything on Google. Okay, I try not to. Okay, uh, but, uh, but, <coughs> very interesting, what you search is very valuable information for them. Why? They did a study and they compared the Center for Disease Control. What is the Center for Disease Control? It's this thing in Atlanta that gets reports from doctors of sicknesses that they diagnose and, cre and create a map of contagion in the United States, what diseases are happening and etc. And by looking at searches on Google, they could predict flu epidemics faster than the Center for Disease Control. Pretty impressive, right? Yeah. Just think about other things that you reveal on Google. Embarrassing things, correct? If you are looking at girls in bikini on the internet, Google knows. <laughs> Guys in bikini on the internet, same thing. <laughs> they know. Okay, so it's the search information is very valuable for them and it's very targeted because uh, you know pretty much what's being searched there. Uh, now, pictures. Uh, is that revealing about pictures? Is pictures revealing? Yes. Well, each picture, the picture itself, each picture comes with its own Okay, he went ahead of what I wanted, but good. So, uh, when you take a picture with a digital smart device, it tags, like HTML, it creates tags of location and identifies thinker. Uh, so that's some information in there. And, but the technology is not yet at the stage of very easily identifying what the object is. But if you think, look at Facebook, or look at the cars of face recognition, they're quite good. Or excellent. Maybe like 95% actually of these things, if there is a model for it. You know what I'm so, uh, we are better at the voice technology than we are at recognition of images. Yeah. Now, besides Google, uh, and I'll come back to Google a little bit, who else collects a lot of information about you? Facebook. Facebook, if you use Facebook, yes. Social media in general, correct? Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. Okay, uh, that's kind of one source. How about, um, have you talked about Amazon? About half of all purchases over the internet are made on Amazon. Also, Amazon have hundreds or maybe thousands, several thousand of stores that are piggyback on Amazon. So, you go skiing in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, the infrastructure of sales of Jackson or Wyoming is based on Amazon. They sell their access and they sell their cloud. So someone has half of all the purchases that being made. <laughs> Next thing, location. You th always think about how do you think that your location is the term? Yeah, but how, how is that established? Yeah, but they, they attach a protein. 
But they did, that doesn't tell the location. What tells you the loca location is either a capture of GPS information, but the most common way is what the technology that we have now actually is called G. And it's basically triangulation from towers. Okay? Uh, theoretically, it's not exactly that way. Cell phones are in an excellent of towers of telephone. And by the strength of the signal, it identifies a little bit worse than GPS, your location. And there is another thing about location, more like country, is the IP number, the number of, of your internet access. Everyone has an IP number. And in the third, it's basically Rutgers has a bunch of IP numbers. And uh, Essex Community College has a bunch of IP numbers. And that kind of give you a generic location, and then you know the country, and etc. But the best is GPS or GPS. But you know location, purchases, what do you search? And then he mentioned one more that is kind of somewhere in the middle, is, is what's in your emails. Why does Google give you free Gmail? How many of you use Gmail as your main account? Most of you. I use Redkins as my main account. But I route my Gmail to my Yahoo mail and I route everything into that. So that's bad because now they know all my email addresses, correct? So what does this tell you? Remember the four tracks, my two tracks became four tracks. Okay? And I say, forget about privacy, privacy is dead. But don't worry too much, you're not very interested. Okay, and I'll come back to this. Okay, meaning interpreting this data, putting it together, doing a lot of things that cost a lot of money. And so directing it to you has to have a reason. Although there are some apps that are genetic. Um, now, this is really many meters interest is advertising and economy, etc. 73 billion spent on digital advertising split between desktop and mobile. Uh, global internet and spending, ad spending, set to drop PD spending this year. Around 200 billion. No one expected this to happen. Google 35 billion in ad revenues. Facebook under 15 billion. Now, one thing about Google. Ad is the top revenue they have, but selling data is becoming a big item for them. And if you start thinking about the idea that they sell the data, you start understanding what kind of things privacy faces. Um, And these are very meters numbers, okay? Um, I invested in heavily in FedEx and UPS, but it was 15 years ago and I didn't do it too good. Now they are going at 10% to cut. Okay, very interesting the story of online purchases. It took a long time for getting off of 1% of sales. But now it's kind of going exponentially. Um, how many of you still go a lot to stores? None? I expect that some females to raise their hand. Because in my household, the female goes to store a lot, and the male never goes to store. I don't think I've walked into the store except to avoid the heat of walking my dog to the air conditioning of Bloomingdale. I live in the city. But I haven't been to a store for 20 years, 50 years. I'm planning to because all my clothes uh, don't fit me very well. So I'm planning once to go to this. But no, they're not telling my personal habits. Just to illustrate what I'm saying is the patterns of buying. Um, the, she talks here about um, 10 billion packages sent a year. And you know, its economic model is really complicated. Um, you guys at Amazon? What is the pricing of the back of, of, of the shipping of packages? <coughs> you spend $75 in one year and you buy Prime. 
and then then it's free. Huh? Phone dog, one day shipping of uh, the same day shipping in Manhattan. But you can get it free too. But what's very interesting is that suppose it's free for two days shipping. So what is the story behind that? Your increment, you can order one package, wait two hours, order another package, wait three hours, order another package, and they are all free. Okay, it's very interesting how, how they can sustain that. It's very interesting. I never really understood. They must have some special deal with FedEx. Something uh, you don't know. But it's very, very interesting. And also, have you understood that instead of you walking to the store, the store is walking to you? And there is an economy of scale there because there's a guy with a truck with a lot of packages there, and he takes one out, takes the other one. There is a good sorting there, mechanism. There is tremendous supply chain associated with that, but is it a net change in, in behavior? How many of you buy food over the internet, not ordering from restaurants, it's deliveries from supermarkets? No one. Yeah, I don't do it either, but my son does. <laughs> okay, now how many of you uh, have food delivered to your home? Like uh, seamless, something like that. Any order from a restaurant to home? Oh, okay, more hands are coming up. Okay, and this is actually a changing habit. More people are delivering uh, restaurants to home, and, uh, food from restaurants to home, more people, the grocery business have taken off very, very slow, but it's moving. It's moving. And this is a whole change in logistics. What are the effects of this? Let's suppose that. 10% of the people stop going to groceries, let's say, except for uh, fruits or something like that, perishable. Um, what, what's the consequence of that? 10%. Um, fewer of the, like, impulse purchases are made? Instead of grocery stores, so that you buy things that you don't intend to buy, so it can get them off of you don't walk past your candy bar and check out line? Actually, I am worse with impulse buying <laughs> over the internet. But, you know, when Amazon sends me offering a new machine learning book, I buy it before I realize I don't need it. Uh, okay, but uh, maybe, but then I think the biggest effect is 10% of less people are going to walk in. And what's the consequence of that? Yeah, look at what's happened here. You know, I, I was I didn't link two things. I walked my dog always in my hand. Okay? And I started no, noting that every block there was a store store for rent. Or every other block. It's sometimes like very big things. And I said the economy is moving. The economy is the best it has been in the last nine years, okay? Why is this? Is Manhattan a local problem and etc. And I finally, and uh, my wife immediately said that store owners are getting greedy, the owners, and charging too much money. Probably some too, but actually this is a, this is a big effect. And the other effect is uh, supermarkets will not pick up the goods, take it to the supermarket and from there, people pick it up, they are going to have bigger warehouses in the boundaries of cities and do a much better supply chain on that. And there will be little robots picking the stuff up in the shelves. I will show you a video of that on the next class or something like that. Um, now, this is a common about the same time Amazon is opening a physical bookstore. Does that mean anything? I don't think so. I think they just want to add. What do you think? No? I really think Amazon wants to get the 
So they want to become like Apple. We are distribution stores. Yeah. Real cool stores. I don't go buying clothes and next time, but I love to go to a cool store next time. Just to look. Subscriptions. How many of you have music subscriptions? If you have Prime, you have music subscriptions, right? Um, should I ask how many 
you do pilot music? No. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay, Netflix has 9 to 8 million paid global subscribers while capturing almost a third of all home entertainment revenues in the West. So Netflix is a big, big success. Uh, who, who are the competitors of Netflix? Amazon. And who else?
And I, I still have Netflix DVD, so it's, although I don't use it very much. Um, now, that was their start in the market. But what happened with that place after that? Come on, guys, think a little bit. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know exactly which land market you want, but uh, they actually offered to sell the blockbuster. Blockbuster said no. Um, yeah, same thing as, as Apple tried to sell to IBM. IBM said no. And then they set up their streaming service two years later, and that's taken off the So what happened then is a new technology came in, streaming. Streaming by itself doesn't do anything. A lot of people have to have devices to stream. Right? If you don't have how many billion billion cell phones they're talking about there, 2.6 or something like that. If you don't have a device, you can't stream to anything. What else do you need? You need software to stream it. And you need someone on the other side to sell it to you. Yes, no, maybe. So what we just did is divide devised the cyber value chain. Or some, sometimes you call it the ecosystem. The way the information goes, goes from the provider to a device to a person. And this is much more complex because there is a flow back of money, correct? There is a distribution network, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But what happened with Netflix? Netflix realized and the, the market started to flatten up and maybe even go down. What did they realize? Yeah. Do you need to start making content? That was one part of the thing because they're paying a lot for content. And what was the other thing? Well, Apple released the iPhone along with the App Store. And people started getting more comfortable doing stuff with their own. Device. Yeah, you know what was the big talking about comfortable? The first thing that was a big obstacle in any of these online sales was the idea of putting your credit card online. Okay, that was very delicate. And in Europe, it took much longer than in the United States. And in other countries, still people are not comfortable to do credit card over the internet. So what do they do? They create prepaid plans. They create little little stores that you go in there and, and pay for your things in India. Uh, there is all kind of varieties of models. But what happened here is that this idea of physically mailing the DVDs started to obsolete because devices proliferated. Other thing is bandwidth proliferated. Bandwidth became wider. Bandwidth is like a tube of data that you can, can get. If it's very tiny, it takes hours to download the DVD. If it's fat, you can download it very fast. And you have to have a live software. But the moment, and what basically happened, uh, Blockbuster went bust. Meaning they basically lost market share and they didn't discover how to change. And who knew and accepted that taken Netflix if Netflix hasn't move in that direction. And that happened what <coughs> Isabel is saying here is that uh, these guys is kind of, well, you know, there is this, people make a lot of money producing movies. So we are going to produce movies too. And the other thing that Netflix was desperately <coughs> doing at that time was getting contracts with people that produce movies. Content became very, very important. But what's the most incredible story behind this? is uh, how Netflix managed to change their model from a very successful model. They didn't sit on their model. And this is what we, uh, we talk about change and the difficulty of dealing with a successful model. Uh, there is a professor from Harvard, a guy called Christensen, uh, that talked about, called, the book is called The Innovator Dilemma. And he talked about what happens when the company that's very successful 
is faced by a technology that they will to totally change their business. And we already had several examples here. Apple tried to sell itself by the end, by the end and buy it. Okay, uh, goes on and on with the stories of uh, dynamically changing type of technology comes in and the dominant company cannot be. Uh, I was at the at at that time, Bell Laboratories. Bell Laboratories was at that time, or during that time, the most success, the largest research center in the world. When I joined Bell Labs in 85 in Colombia, uh, Bell Labs had, had around uh, 20,000 employees, of which 8,000 are PhDs in the physical science in general, and they had a budget of $4 billion. So uh, this company developed everything that you use in telephony, maybe not the current version, but an older version. And turned out they finished up without the cell phone company, without the mobile company. And many they are developed first cell phones were, or something like a cell phone where it was in the lab. We tried uh, things like different types of equipment and things that I was working on into the lab. And we finished up with output because this disrupt disruptive technology as opposed to sustainable technology was just going to change the business model dramatically. What did they do to resolve this problem? Eventually they went out and paid a fortune for a, for a mobile company and called it but uh, they just couldn't pick the company out. So this kind of story, the disruptive technology story is very serious. And I have a reason to introduce it here. Uh, and the reason is, uh, I think auditing is starting to go through disruptive change. Don't look so sad. You are still in the safe side of, the, of, of this disruptive change. They're still hiring, they're hiring more now than they're hiring the past. Okay, but uh, I was speaking at the uh, PCOB, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, and this is the organization created by somebody in Oxford to regulate and inspect CPA firms. And they were all talking about disruption. Uh, four people from the firms and board members and etc. And we are going to come back and talk about, about what's changing. But uh, I already introduced it a little bit. Technology is changing. And the data that's available is changing. And um, the business model is changing. The firms are making much more money from consulting than from auditing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there is a lot of thought being placed on how do you create this oversight function, keep this oversight function honest with integrity and doing the verification function that it needs? And when I was talking about XBRL here and then I talked about assurance, I was already starting to address this kind of revolution that hasn't happened very well in accounting yet and certainly hasn't happened in order. So this is where we are going. So stay with this and remember these words disruptive, disruptive technology, and actually business and cost to state. And the thesis by Christensen is that, and I think the title of Innovator Dilemma used to be Innovator Dilemma, why big successful company and this is a story, uh, the most classic story is, have you ever heard of Western Union? Okay. You guys must have heard. Western Union is a leading transfer money to foreign countries. But Western Union used to be the largest telecommunication company in the world. Mm -hmm. Turn of the century last century. And the telecommunication they did was in telephone calls was telegraph. Have you ever heard of telegraph? Telegraph 
stylography who kind of wrote the text, and they broke it down, uh, and they sent little messages to all around the world. My uncle was an expert on sending telegrams with the Brazil. And he abbreviated the words and joined the words in a way he charged by word. Okay. Except that no one on the other side understood what he, <laughs> what he did. But he was very good at creating cheap telegrams. Okay. But Western Union was a very large telecommunication company. And then this guy, Alexander Graham Bell, comes up with this invention, which was the telephone. Okay. And he went, same kind of story, went to Western Union and said, you want to buy my, my patent, you want to help me? And they said, nah, who is going to use this thing? And yeah, Western Union is gone, and Alexander Graham Bell created our own this technology. There were hundreds, maybe thousands of companies created. And then the US government decided that it was better to allow an monopoly as opposed to all the little companies that they talked to. So it is different. And it's a whole different story, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. But remember the story of disruptive technology, technology that changes things very much, as opposed to sustaining technologies, which is a technology that marginally improves what they do. Um, so this is natural. Okay. okay, today about four in ten, thirty-seven dollars spent in global IT infrastructure goes to cloud spending from two in ten dollars in 2008. What is this idea of cloud infrastructure? Uh, let me ask someone that is not so technical to get the interpretation. Yeah, sorry, right. Samantha. Uh, because it's for your device. Okay, and what is up in there? I guess on there, like, whatever company it is, in their computers. Yeah. Okay, right. So instead of having having their own data center, they they outsource it to like a third party, but to uh, and everything is in like this large centralized data center, right? And and like like organizations like the central intelligence agency. Yeah, so Amazon, and, and so Amazon like, okay, that, that's a good, that's a good, good story. Actually, uh, just imagine something the size of this building, but not only one floor, all the floors, like a five football field size, full of computers, and it's not big computers, it's basically boards, and there are these racks. Racks, which are these shelves, board by board by board by board, and wires in between them going to the racks. So maybe 10,000 to 500,000 boards. And there are tubes coming in of telecommunication. And that telecommunication doesn't go directly to the board, go to uh, operating system, which is software, that basically allocates the communication to one of those little boards. All the time, a couple of boards are broken, people replace. But at that time, that operating system passes to the other ones. And very often, there are two or three of the boards replicating the process for one of the other. Typically, what they use is a thing called Hadoop, which is an operating system on top of it. But these are huge computers, typically they're located in cold places, because probably the, the largest operational expense that they have is air conditioning. So Alaska is a good place for it, Siberia is a good place for it, okay? I haven't heard anyone in the South Pole, but I would imagine that for today, <coughs> maybe South Pole would be good, okay? But you need two things, you need coal, you also need telecommunication in there, and power, I guess, three things. Okay. So these big, big stations of computers, and people sell Amazon as, uh, as a very large, uh, a very large servicing in the cloud, 
but IBM is competing in Apple, is competing in everyone is competing in this domain. And how do you put data then to either wire telecommunication or to wireless and to wire that gets there? And how do you think about that design? Borrowing a big computer in the sky. And that's the way you describe it, actually. And that's really a good way to think about it. But it's more, I just want you to now think a little bit out of the box and think how is this changing our life and our world? Having these huge computing centers sitting around in different places that you have no idea where they are, you don't have to know. And how are they changing your life? What, what's affecting you on this whole thing? Okay, let me go with something. But you're thinking of something. If you need something, correct? Uh, maybe you want to invent a little CPU board you put here. With inside, inside. Is that gross? Have you seen them? There are films that have that, correct? Yeah. And have you think about the USB board that you kind of stick in your head? I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding. Okay? So, it gives you ubiquity, meaning you can be anywhere. And what is the big limiting factor? <laughs> the board thing, I'm just kidding. Uh, the limiting factor is the communication ability between the device and the cloud. And typically, it doesn't go from the device to the cloud, the device to some to AT&T, AT&T to the cloud. Okay, that is this communication. But what else is it changing? So ubiquity is very important. What else? Uh, I, I'm holding on on you, I want other people to think. Okay. Uh, so the communication between devices, uh, I have my computer, my cell phone, my tablet, I'm connected to my account. Yeah, that's actually a very recent development. You know, you think this thing takes so for granted, my granddaughter takes it for granted, that you forget that this is a very new thing. Having a devout box that every device you have have the same data. You don't know how many hours I spent synchronizing my devices in the old days and making sure I had backups and everything. Uh, so that's very interesting thing. Similar content. What else? Um, space. Uh, data. Uh, on recently, three years ago, a guy who worked for Google created a cell phone that's all cloud based and that then has storage in the phone, which is a system server. So, uh, is it, what is the problem with this device with not with their own with the lack of their own memory? Huh? Yeah. Privacy is a little big issue. So someone can. It's sitting it. over there. If that thing doesn't have privacy, you don't have privacy. The second thing is you depend on telecommunication. You are in the subway. Maybe it's not very good. You are within Rutgers. When class finish that everyone turns on, it's not very good. Yeah? Well, I was about to say, it makes storage cheaper. And so uh, it's all economically feasible to do it. They're going to be data centers to put the big data. That's why big data is such a big thing right now because of the cheap availability storage. Like 30, 20, 30 years ago, computers used to be like a yeah, I think that's a chicken and an egg story. It's not only about storage becoming cheaper, it's also my demand for storage becoming bigger. And I don't know which one the last is, but you're right. But this is the kind of thing you need to do. Go ahead. Uh, from the business aspect of it, it allows uh, companies to scale much more rapidly and make themselves more Okay, I, I want this as a very good point. I want you to. Meaning, we start talking here, I keep repeating, so we kind of, uh, you know, say that again, what you just said. It allows companies to be more agile with their story. So let's say they bring on a large account, they don't have to worry about buying racks and racks. And That's certain. a very big change in the business model. Because, and this is what they call the Silicon Valley model, and which is the idea that instead of you having to invest $10 million in a computer facility, and then start using it. 
you pay incrementally by usage. Probably if you would use up one third of your $10 million facility, uh, would be more expensive than the incremental use. But if you use the $10 million, it would be cheap. But that's uh, what really made startups so easy to do, is the fact that most computer services are incrementally, incrementally priced these days. Okay, you guys haven't taken manager account yet. But there is this classic model, fixed cost and variable cost. Fixed cost is what your setup cost is. And then for every new unit that manufacture, there is a straight line here that per unit it becomes cheaper because it keeps some of the base cost. And actually what this this model, the silicon value model did, is eliminated the fixed cost. Because it's bought by Amazon or whoever, whoever is providing it, spend the money, and then it's selling you little bits, makes your life much easier. If you're a very big guy, maybe it's cheaper for you to do it yourself. Okay, stay with us, thoughts, we are going to continue. Um, okay, so this is the infrastructure uh, story. Oh, okay, I want to say, make another point here that they don't make. Is this is like a pendulum. Where did we start? With a big, fat computer in a room like this, costing a fortune. Uh, with no access. Then this computer kind of went a little bit smaller, went transistor, went integrated circuits, uh, and then we started putting wires to it, and then we took the wires out, and then we did wireless into it, but still a big computer. And then Mr. Jobs came in, and some other guys came in, Mr. Gates, of course, and he went for this big computer devices for companies to have in these PCs. And the PCs basically replaced the two dumb terminals that connected to the computer. So we went from a centralized computing to a time-shared centralized computer to wireless devices connected to computer. And then these wireless devices became pretty autonomous and do a lot of things by itself. And look what's ha happening now. We are going back to this big computer in the sky and your laptop and your cell phone is not doing as much as did before. Okay, I want you to think a little bit more and tell me a couple of things that could not be done without very large computers somewhere to be accessed. And I'm not going to ask you because I don't know that people to think about it. I know you know. Okay. Uh, video oh, you already went too far. What is the biggest? What is the biggest databases about you too that you can query if you find want to find any type of information? Google. You think you could do Google in your laptop? Google has billions of entries, correct? Let me see. Google, tell me the, the girlfriend of Peter Falk. <laughs> Google, you probably know the answer. You don't even know who Peter Falk is. Well, a few of you might know. Peter Falk? Oh, he Yes. Still remember him. Okay. Um, so Google actually has this very, very large farm of information sitting around. And of course, everyone trying to copy Google as a tool. Okay, everyone is building, but Google is better because they have more people set searching it. So there is more examples to be, uh, to be harvested and more questions to be organized and extracted. Okay, I want you to think a little bit. This is not directly here, but I want you to think a little bit. How do you think that this Google thing works? Come on, put your brains into it. Yeah. Uh, basically, a supercomputer goes through. Uh, and it's very ties and code on the two Okay, 
they are getting very complex. But how did they start? Well, how did they start? So very think and so did when at Stanford, they were PhD students at Stanford University, and they came up with this algorithm called PageMap, and, and they were ranking web pages. Okay, let's start even before that. Uh, the, the problem is a web search problem. What was happening there is you wanted to develop a way to find things on the web. The web was growing very fast, and it was difficult to find something, unless you told me what your address was. I didn't know how to get it. But this, you wanted to find things that, that that wasn't the case. So there were things like out of this and Yahoo that were search engines. And Yahoo was actually had a person organizing by talking. And then out of this, they had like a search algorithm. And there were several of these things out there. And then happened that these guys uh, developed an algorithm that basically how frequently things were, sh were being looked for was important to be on a stack of information that you're looking for. And then they developed little robots, we call them crawlers, that went and this is connected to that. So we have that address and we have this address. And then you have this address and you keep collecting. And then many and many of these crawlers went around the world looking for connections. And they went back to this thing and see there a new connection. The moment Hengao wrote another link, that link would go on that thing. So this was kind of the big tree getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And, but what it had there was just a little uh, URL, a, a, a little address. But they were smart, and they realized that putting a little bit more of the content there was a good idea. And then they realized that they could charge people for putting their content on top of other people. And then they said, well, we'll set up some algorithms. Remember this word, algorithm? Uh, they set up some algorithms whereby I don't need to price these things manually, but depending on the conditions, it creates a price for putting yourself on the top. So they sell dynamically uh, those price things on the internet search thing. And the first one, two, or three is what everyone tends to click, unless you are cheap like me and try to find something cheaper in those things. Uh, and then they discovered that organizing that thing reasonably well could give them some information that they didn't have before. And you know, these things on the internet, you don't think everything in advance. You keep developing and you keep thinking about your problems here. You have a lot of smart, they have a lot of smart people working it, and they keep developing new things that they wanted to do with us. And that's actually the way these things develop. Now, these databases they have out that say, what's the life of Peter Falk, or who was the person who first came to America, or uh, who was whatever question you have, how do you think they do that? I'm not interested in the answer, I'm interested in what you think about how they do it, individually. Someone already talked. Original ideas is not an idea that no one else has talked about. An original idea is an idea that you have, and you don't know that someone else has. And if you do enough of those, you'll have one of yours that is totally original. And they are typically associations. But how do you think that they, uh, they do these things? How do you think that they kind of have all these interesting questions you can ask? All of you, I guarantee you that you pick up your phone or yourself and try to remember something, go there and ask the question to, to move. And you sit down with your girlfriend in, in a restaurant and very soon both of you are finding things on the internet that part of the discussion. Or just communicate them. And how do they how do they do this thing of creating answers to questions on the internet? What's the easiest way to do? Mm, 
cognitive computing dissertation. And what we are trying to do with that hasn't been done as far as I know in the CPA firms, is have these Google questions be auditing questions on a very narrow domain, breaking down the part of the audit, which we call the brainstorm part of the audit, where you look at the basics. But the basic concept of organizing the knowledge, capturing the knowledge, is going to be cumulative. So Chow is thinking about KPMG having 1,000 partners that they have, 1,200 partners that they have, all using this planner. And the more they use the planner, more the planner knows what to respond. And there'll be some guys down in Atlanta or in New York City, or actually Montreal in New Jersey, uh, that the question they don't know how to answer will research and put an answer that the official KPMG answer. This is called the restricted domain knowledge base. Restricted domain. Now let's go back to talk about Google a little bit. Is it interesting or isn't it interesting? It's very interesting. Uh, by the way, 10 years from now, this is not going to be novel. It's going to be very, very simple, current type of thing. I don't know if auditing will get there, they're very slow. But, uh, you know, I'm sure Google and Apple and uh, Microsoft are going to come up with products of very narrow domain, knowledge organization. And where does that leave you guys? Who, will you not have a job? You guys don't have a problem because you are going to be in the market soon. How about people 10 years from the future, in the future? Mm -hmm. There will be a different knowledge skill, I think. I, I think that still there will be many jobs for verifiers, assurance. Okay. Amazon. Amazon Web Services captured 50%, 70% of the public cloud market, followed by Microsoft 34, Google 15%, IBM 8%. Does that surprise you? You thought Amazon made money by selling books? You know, Amazon is a very interesting company if you want to look at the business side of them. They are one of the few companies that are very oriented towards long term as opposed to short term. And so they don't care if a particular business of them is making very little money. Actually, Amazon store lost money for the first 15 years or something like that. But people keep buying Amazon stock. Why? Capturing market share. They were growing, and the more people touch your application, the more mon money eventually they can make. And they were right. So, this is Mary Meeker's prize slide, in my opinion. The enterprise IT trends from 2000 to 2017. You already, we already discussed, discussed from on-premise to cloud-based uh, pricing, subscription, and perpetual license. But the thing that she doesn't talk about there is the idea of incremental costing as opposed to fixed and variable costing. User interface, generic or personalized. Intelligence, what does that mean? Um, constrained or, or unlimited? Yes. Is that in reference to like business intelligence? I don't think exactly. It has to do with what we're talking about knowledge base. Either you constrain it into being very good at a few questions or you do our Google. 
whereby you keep adding questions, adding questions, and sometimes very good, sometimes so so. Okay? Um, I actually don't understand very well what the engine means here. Does anyone know what it is? Uh, purchase decision top down to bottom up is basically companies don't decide anything what you buy, you decide uh, as an employee what you buy. Um, okay, this is something also not terribly interesting. Uh, uh, basically, uh, what is a designer? And what is a developer? A developer is someone that puts code together. The designer is someone that makes things quick or creates interfaces. And what basically they are saying is that the designer to developer in 2010 was 1 to 11. So there was one designer to 11 people. And now uh, there is one designer to 8 developers. Okay. So what does it mean? Uh, software became better to help. Uh, help developers or whatever. Okay, let's go international a little bit. China. Uh, there are 700 mobile internet users in China. Uh, in 2016, $40 billion was spent on online advertising, China, up from $10 billion in 2012. Now, what do you think about the markets in China and what do you think that happened with our big companies like Google in China. Uh, China development protecting their own domestic industry and also making sure that their 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 companies have a place to sell their products outside of their own country. So they have the balance to that, that's what you want. Of course that's what you want. You want your companies to be the leaders in your own country and sell well in the other ones. But if you do too much of that, what happens? The other countries say, no, you can't come into our country. Yes or no? Okay, so that's, and of course, Google is not very big in China. Uh, and China has another complication, which is the big firewall in China, which is, uh, they basically control a lot of communication in and out of the country, but they also control a lot of communication inside the country. I went to visit my son. My son was spending this the early days of the internet in uh, in uh, in Beijing, in uh, what do you University Beijing, and uh, he wanted to get rid of me. Okay, because he had to see to us. Okay, so he sat in the room on a computer, and he said, this keyboard has characters. You don't want to know who is this. I don't know how. I can't type without looking at the characters if you put me on an American keyboard. And then I said, but I can't go get out of it because the title was No problem. I don't know what he did, but I was doing Google. I was doing everything, uh, etc. So there are ways around the big firewall, but it's a very, very controlled environment. And of course, an additional difficulty that you need to know character language, correct? Which, of course, for Chinese is not that big. My wife is Chinese, so I'm used to this. I only know the words that help insult the husband of Chinese. <laughs> I shouldn't say this in front of the thing. She will see it and give me help. <laughs> Andrea is laughing because she met her. Okay, now this is actually a very big thing in, uh, in the internet. You see what has happened recently in the internet, that the sales of computer devices flattened up. The sales of internet related devices flattened up. Why? Because people have it already. And it's expensive. But what actually a big market, low market is India because India hasn't matured into the market. So there are 355 million Indian internet users. What's the population of India, by the way? It's similar to China. Okay. It's a little bit small. Well, 
little bit smaller. But look at how many how many users there are in China and how many users are in in China 700 million, in India 355 million. Okay. And this is the other revealing thing. 80% of all web traffic in India is for mobile. And the global average for that is 50%. What does it mean? That the other devices are uh, not so popular in India or too expensive. Okay, I just a couple more things. Um, and then I'll be a little bit. Okay? I know this is heavy thinking here if you're paying attention. So. Um, 87% of U.S. office-based physicians use electronic health care records, up from 21% in 2004. 95% of hospitals offer patient digital care across their health care information, up to 24%. Okay, so what's happening in health care? This is like a big Obama thing. You can criticize Obamacare as much as you want, but in the whole Obamacare effort, we, did. we put a lot of money aside to create digitalization of medicine. So I think in New York State now, for you to get medicine and prescription, you can't get a paper prescription. The doctor has to basically email it to your pharmacy. Okay, that's the good side. The bad side is that technology is the best one that they're using, and they really should do much more of this. And in the US, you are full of similar tests. You go to one doctor, he gives you blood test. Two days later, you go to another doctor, he gives you a new blood test. Why? One is they don't talk to the other. The second one is doctors get some benefits out of giving the tests. Uh, there's a lot of things. It's very, very wasteful. US, uh, the US is number one in spending per capita in population. So the US spends one third more than Switzerland per capita. Even considering the US have about 20 million people, 50 million people that are uninsured today. Okay, and to make things worse, the US is 22nd in quality of medical. So spends the most and are 22nd in time. So what do you think of that? And this is this is motivation for Obamacare. And since then, I think things got a little bit better, but not much better. It's not a reason to, to eliminate the value. It's a reason to improve. Okay. But this is the basic model of delegating to insurance companies. It's creating a lot of intermediaries. You know, come to countries like Canada, France, uh, that are very high up in the, uh, in the quality of average care. Uh, these countries have basically not to be the state. They basically pay directly to doctors to service markets. This is ugly made burdens for socialized medicine. But in average, they pay their clients, meaning the people, get better service, but they don't get all the services they need. You have to look for specialists or if you want to spend something that's not for the service. But what Obama did that was great is make this is give a lot of credit to Obama for this electronization of medical care and etc. And uh, it's getting better, and I think that's going to have a big effect. Um, okay, this is actually very interesting to see how the U.S. spends <coughs> the money in technology. U.S. federal budget in 2016 was about 3.85 trillion dollars. Of that, 63 percent goes to entitlement and other health care, social security, Medicare, Medicaid. 16% non-defense discretionary, 15% to defense, and 6% for servicing debt. So what does this tell you? Tell you that the government doesn't have a lot of control about what it spends. And uh, entitlement spending accounts for about two thirds of the recovery. Um, uh, two trillion left off and that was about 19 trillion. And by the way, the rule typically that uh, uh, 
international financing organizations, and if your debt is larger than your GNP, that's a problem. And but what what do we understand here? Um, and actually, if you look at some detail, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. doesn't have a lot of money to spend in technology, and should be spending it. And what's really the problem is in the U.S. infrastructure is the U. Overall, that's in general. Now, some very interesting things for you accountants or for you users of information is the Open Data Act, which basically says that federal organizations need to provide data on details of what they spend. And so, City of Newark, Ohio, all kinds of states are opening their data up. And uh, in your, in, you're going to take talk of the audit analytics uh, in January, February, March, and then you're going to be using some of the data and trying to do some analysis. Uh, a couple of our PhD students uh, uh, did a study. It's called, the, they call it the armchair audit study. And the idea is that if you put all this government information Basically, like the Ohio check is what Ohio spends every check into the Ohio. So it's very interesting. And so basically, the idea was Tony Blair who had this idea said, let's put this information in the public domain, and therefore the citizens are going to supervise <coughs> what the government does. So Chow, which I mentioned here, uh, mentioned here before, and I think it was Chi, it was Chow and Chi, wasn't it? Oh, June. And June and Chow? Okay, uh, so two of our PhD students, I'm going to meet both of them because I'm going to present something to you. Uh, June and Chow wrote a paper where she think they picked up contracts from the Brazilian government and tried to understand uh, how they were spending their money. And first, the contracts were not there, just the metadata data of the contracts, the data about the contracts. Second, turned out that uh, June and Chow are very confident computer competent. And uh, they had a lot of difficulty doing this. So what's happening is that when you publish this government data, uh, you don't put all the data that should be there, no one inspects it, uh, maybe you design it not to be very informational. There are a lot of stories happening in this. But this is very, don't, don't take it negative. This is extremely positive development. Because from one moment to the other, there is a lot of transparency in the system. And what I think is going to happen is what happened in industry too. You buy an application, then the application goes on top of the other one, the other one goes on top of them. And it's not really you, the armchair audit, that's going to do this. The people that could analyze the data is the people that sell to the government, the people that buy from the government, the clients or the customers. Why? Because they want to figure out what the competition is, this and that, and etc. And of course, it was absolutely possible. So that's a very good development. In the US, I think we'll be able to do it. So guys, how about a little break? We start at 4 o'clock. And then we can lower it in the
Thank you. 